Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bianca Gonzalez, and I am the Bullying Prevention Program Coordinator with the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation. Before we go ahead um, and get into our presentation today, I just want to go ahead and thank our wonderful, wonderful sponsors, uh, Riverside Medical Clinic and United Way of the Inland Valleys. Um, we truly appreciate your continued support um, with our Take 30 webinars. Um, there will be a short Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, so if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them at the chat box to the right-hand side of the screen, and then you also have a chance to do it towards the bottom of the screen as well. Um, our presenter today will be um, writing some questions for our viewers today, so please keep in mind that any answers can be entered through our chat box on the right-hand side. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our presenter for today, Ms. Jenna Jenna Peterson founded 57 North Hampton, a nonprofit that allows her to explore fun and creative methods of teaching mental health and coping strategies for children and teenagers. Through 57 North Hampton, she has hosted play shops, parties, and other events, spoken at venues all across the nation, including the National Girl Bullying Conference, and written and illustrated children's books and teaching manuals. When she's not working, she's either pre pretending to be Beethoven, pretending to be Michelangelo, pretending to be Nancy Kerrigan, or pretending to be in the chopped kitchen. Another fun fact, she also enjoys napping a lot, just like I do. I will go ahead and give it away to Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Bianca, for that introduction. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your very busy afternoon to spend a little bit of time with me while I make my case for play. Um, this is in no means going to be an in-depth conversation. I know that we only have 30 minutes together, but I really want to take this opportunity to just introduce you to some concepts that I'm hoping you will take the time to deep dive into when you have a little bit of free time, okay? I promise what you find is going to blow your mind. All right, so I'm an old child, but more importantly, as the founder and executive director of 57 Northampton, um, play is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, Bianca mentioned that we are all about finding fun and innovative ways of teaching mental health and coping strategies to children and teens. Um, but once upon a time, our mission was just teaching the mental health and coping strategies. Um, but what we found out pretty early on, embarrassingly early actually, was that you can't just walk into, say, a room of second graders and just start talking about mental health. All right, the teachers can make them sit still and they can make them be quiet while we're talking, but they can't make them interested in wanting to learn or actually learning the concepts that we're trying to teach. So what we got was a lot of glazed eyes, um, blank stares, a lot of really useful information that we were trying to give was going in one ear and out the other. So we realized pretty early on that we needed to add an element of play just to hook them in. And when that was really effective, we decided, hey, what if all of our offerings were play-based and we just kind of integrate these mental health concepts into the play itself? Guys, the results was, were just incredible, just incredible. Um, schools that we've played at have uh, told us, reported back that their students are showing more empathy, better cooperation, more self-control. And as much as I would like to take credit for pretty much all of that and, and you know, say that it's our concepts and the and things that we're teaching, the more that I dive into this concept, this topic of play, the more I'm realizing that everything that they're reporting back is a direct result of play. Um, one really good example of play you can find, um, I need to introduce you to my dog, Charlie. All right, I know there are some people who probably know me and are watching and are thinking, of course, she found a way to talk about her dog. I did. And uh, it's pertinent, though, so hang in there with me. Um, Charlie is a teacup Yorkie, so he's highly intelligent, very, very smart, very pathetic, very perceptive, sorry, very empathic. He's a practical dog, though, so he doesn't really play unless there's food involved. So it's not play so much as it is just basic survival, all right? He doesn't run around. He's not doing a lot to entertain himself. He's not exploring. He's, he's just, so he's really, as you can imagine, a very quiet dog, um, aloof, kind of judgmental, if we're being honest. Um, he's very fearful, as a matter of fact. He doesn't adapt well to new circumstances, any new surroundings, new people. Um, 
new toys, new sounds, just, it's not that he's just apprehensive. He has a really visceral reaction to where he's either peeing on himself or running to me for protection or worst case scenario, just attacking or the teacup Yorkie version of attack. All right. And so as you can imagine, he, he doesn't have a lot of doggy friends. He's very antisocial. All right. Now, in order to make this example make sense, I need to introduce you to one more character, Chloe. Chloe is Charlie's annoying little cousin. All right. This is my sister's dog. Now, Chloe is very curious. She's bossy. She's high energy. She's fearless, independent, sociable, friendly. And just to round out the list, she's annoying. This has nothing to do with my example. It's just a fact. All right. So here's where it gets interesting. Charlie was a rescue who was abused as a puppy. Could you tell when we read through some of the characteristics of fearful antisocial behavior, things like that? Charlie was about one when I got him, and there was no fur growing on his back and sides. He was covered in mange. His paws, his face, his, his head was covered in mange, scars, uh, t uh, I started to say teas and flicks, but um, <laughs> ticks and fleas um, smell terrible. And from being subjected to that kind of abuse in puppyhood, he learned to stay still. He learned to stay quiet and to stay hidden. And most importantly, what he learned was that fear was survival for him. All right. Now, on the other hand, you have Chloe, who was also a rescue, but she was a stray. So my sister also got her around one. She was very skinny, very malnourished from rummaging through trash cans and looking for food. Um, as a stray, you know, no doubt she was subjected to a lot of really dangerous situations where she either had to run and hide or stand up and defend herself. As a matter of fact, she has a scar that's about maybe four inches long that goes down the center of her back. Um, and we will never know how she sustained that injury. But we also know that strays, in order to survive, they have to learn to adapt. They have to learn independence. They have to learn how to feel fear, but to move through it anyway and not be controlled by it. And um, they're also given an opportunity that a lot of abused dogs aren't, and that's the opportunity to play, okay? So even though Chloe is bearing physical signs of severe trauma, just like Charlie is, she is resilient and independent and fearless where Charlie is kind of maladjusted and timid and afraid, all right? Tying this all together, there was a study done of baby rats, all right, which we know are very highly social creatures, which is both parts interesting and terrifying, all right? These baby rats, they took a, a, a group of them and had their cerebral cortexes removed. The cerebral cortex, we know, is the part of the brain that's associated with the higher self. So uh, thinking, perceiving, understanding, so on and so forth. So they had one part of the, the group, they maybe separated them by half and had their cerebral cortexes removed. They put them back together. And at four weeks old, all of the baby rats began to squeak at each other and play and socialize together. <clears throat> so well to the, uh, so much, in fact, that observers could not tell the difference between the rats who had been operated on and those who hadn't. Why is this important? Because contrary to popular opinion or a popular thought, play is not elective behavior. Kids don't just see other kids playing and say, oh, that looks fun, I, I wanna play now. Rather, play is hardwired into the survival parts of the mammal brain, survival, meaning that it's necessary, all right? But what is play? Um, we hear people use the word play in a lot of different scenarios, you know, you play too much or play to your strengths or even in the, the title of this presentation, power play, okay? So what exactly does it mean? More importantly, what are the characteristics of play and the way that we're referring to it right now? Play is, number one, it's active, all right? Children use their bodies and their minds during play. They interact with the environment, with materials, and with other people. Play is adventurous and it's risky. Play helps children to explore the unknown. That element of pretend offers a safety net that encourages children to take risks. Okay, so for instance, it's safer to pretend to drive a car than it is to actually drive a car, all right? At least in most circumstances. Okay, play is communicative. Children share information and knowledge through their play. Their communication can be verbal or nonverbal. It can be simple or it can be complex. Play is enjoyable kind of self-explanatory. Play is fun. 
and exciting and it involved a sense of humor. If your child is in the corner crying, probably not play would be my guess. All right, play is involved. Children become deeply absorbed and focused in their play, concentrating and thinking about what they're doing. Number six, play is meaningful. Children play about what they've seen and heard, what they know. Play helps them to build and extend their knowledge, understanding and skills in a way that makes sense to them. Play is sociable and it's interactive. Children play alongside or along with others. Sometimes they also like and need to play alone. Play is symbolic. Children imagine and pretend when they're playing. They try out ideas, feelings, and roles. They reenact the past. They rehearse the future. I'm sure we've seen children who have not yet learned how to read pretending to read or haven't yet learned how to write pretending to write. I know when I was four years old, I started noticing my mother would write on these little slips of paper and take it to the grocery store and walk out with a whole cart of groceries. So I started carrying around a little notepad and just scribbling it because that's what it looked like she was doing to me and trying to exchange it for candy at the gas station. You will be pleased to know that I am now like really good at spending money, all right? Play is therapeutic. Play helps children to express and work through emotions and experiences. So in that way, it really helps to release and reduce stress for children. And last but not least, play is voluntary. Children choose to play. That play is spontaneous. They shape it as they go, changing characters, events, objects, and locations. So, Bianca warned you, we got a little pop quiz. Which of these is a characteristic of play? And you can use your chat box to answer this, all right? A, play is simple. B, play is solitary or C, play is symbolic. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, we got A, A and C, okay. Well, you guys are active on here. All right, the answer is, dun -da -da -da, play is symbolic. I tried to throw you off with a little Okay, but it's symbolic, all right? And so it seems like we have a really good baseline understanding of what play is. And so we're gonna move on to talking about the various types of play. Um, there are so many different types of play just because kids are so unique and they're influenced by different cultures and different characters around them. So there are things like object play, pretend play, outdoor play. But for the sake of this presentation, we're gonna talk about two types and that's free play versus guided play. All right, free play versus guided play. Now free play is any unstructured, voluntary, child initiated activity, that part is important, um, that allows children to develop their imaginations while exploring and experiencing the world around them. It is spontaneous play that comes naturally from children's natural curiosity, love of discovery and enthusiasm. All right, so your child in a bathroom with the door closed, making some kind of paste out of Comet shaving cream and lemon pledge would be free play, okay? Don't act like you didn't do it, all right? Whereas guided play is any form of play where children explore within an environment that has been prepared by adults and or with guidance from adults. So same scenario, your child at a kitchen table uh, making some kind of strange paste out of, what did I say, um, shaving cream, Lemon Pledge, did I say Comet, something like that. Your child making a concoction out of those uh, items that you set in front of them will be considered guided play, okay? Because there's an adult involved, all right? So why you would do that, I, that's between you and God. All right, there's a lot of benefits to both guided and free play. Free play has a lot of cognitive, social, <clears throat> um, emotional, mental, and obviously physical benefits. For the sake of time, we're only going to focus on four of the benefits of free play. This is in no means the range of the benefits of free play, all right? The first is collaborative play skills. These are skills such as taking turns, sharing, following rules, negotiating, compromise, just your overall cooperation, all right? This teaches children to get along, to develop conflict resolution skills, to develop self-advocacy skills where they can stand up for themselves or convey ideas, all right? Uh, helps to develop social competence and basically the appropriate ways to interact with each other, okay? The second benefit that we're going to cover is that it teaches emotional regulation. Now, this is super important because it helps you to regulate 
emotions, especially the ones that are really tough to regulate at a moment's notice, all right? We're talking about fear and anger, all right? Those two specifically. Who here has ever played tag? Who, who still plays tag? Because I do, all right? In tag, when you're playing tag and somebody's trying to tag you out and they're running behind you and they're getting really, really close and you can almost feel them already touching your back and you're freaking out and you're panicking. In that moment, that is one of the scariest moments of our lives, right? I don't know why, but it is. Well, I do know why we're going to talk about it. But in that moment, are you stressed? No, you're not stressed. You're definitely not stressed. And the reason why is because this type of play activates the fight or flight response in you without the additional release of cortisol, which is the stress hormone that comes along in actually dangerous, life-threatening situations. All right. So what this does is it allows you to experience fear. To, to, to feel the fear in a safe and fun environment and to practice moving through it anyway, all right? So you're scared, you're terrified because this person's getting ready to tag you out, but you're able to run and you're able to be level enough and regulated enough so that you see there's a rock over there, I'm gonna jump over it instead of being so panicked that I can't see it and I trip and fall, okay? Or, you know, you're scared, but you're able to practice jumping and wrestling and climbing and crawling under things if you have to. And the reason why this is so important is because what this does for children is it allows them to practice for when they could be in potentially actual real life dangerous situations. So let's say a child who's, you know, playing this type of risky free play regularly is now being chased by a dog. Just hypothetically, okay, God forbid this happens. This child, because they've been able to practice running and jumping and climbing, will now have a certain degree of level-headedness in this situation because they know how to run, they know how to climb a fence if they have to, and if worse comes to worse, they know how to turn around and possibly defend themselves, all right? So that's the second one. The third one is that it increases empathy. And to explain this, we're gonna look at Abby here. Abby is a five-year-old girl, and one of the hallmarks of being a five-year-old girl is that you don't have a job or responsibilities or kids, okay? That's one of the hallmarks. But here, Abby is playing teacher, and so she has the trifecta, all three, all right? So Abby is, she's talking to her class, and she's trying to get them to stay quiet so that she can teach them some kind of concept. But they keep talking about how boring this game is and how they want to leave and just not paying attention at all. And I guarantee you that after 15 minutes of this, Abby is ready to go home to her box of Juicy Juice and her SpongeBob SquarePants, all right? I guarantee you that after just 15 minutes of this kind of free play, Abby can now go to school and understand why it's a, maybe a little bit important to listen to her teacher the first time, all right? Why is that? That's because this type of pretend play where she has taken on a role has given her just a little bit of understanding. It's provided her this tiny little peephole into the life of what it's like for someone who has to assume that role daily. And so it increases her empathy towards that person in that role, all right? It's not a huge thing. She doesn't have a full understanding, but it's a really, really excellent start. And this type of play has actually been shown to increase empathy in children towards animals, which is pretty incredible, all right? The last benefit that we're going to cover of free play is that it teaches self-control. Uh, to illustrate this, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at this through the lens of make-believe free play, kind of like Abby. All right, this here is Diana. All right, and Diana is playing doctor with her friends. So this is Dr. Diana, DB, if you will. All right, so Dr. Diana, she has her little reflex hammer, and she's tapping on her patient's knees to check the reflexes and whatnot. And she has a little stethoscope and she's checking the, the heartbeat and her patient's vitals. And if at any point she takes off her, her stethoscope, that's my spaghetti, like it's hard for me to say, like my tongue gets stuck behind my teeth. But if she takes off her stethoscope and she starts twirling it in the air like a lasso and yelling giddy up at her patients, you can rest assured that her playmates are gonna pull her back in line and say, cut it out, get back to work. You're not getting played to, to horse around. <laughs> Sorry, I had to pun. Um, anyway, but her playmates are going to pull her back in line. But the truth is, even without that additional P 
peer pressure, Diana is still guided by what she already knows about the role of a doctor, all right? So she has those mental guardrails that are keeping her from turning into a cowgirl and riding off into the sunset, all right? And in adhering to those guidelines in this free play, guess what Dr. Diana is learning? Self-control, exactly. There was an actual study done of four-year-olds where they were asked to stand at attention for as long as they could, all right? Obviously, none of them could last longer than a minute because they're four, all right? But when they were given a make-believe scenario that they were guards protecting a castle, they were able to stand for more than four minutes. That's incredible for four-year-olds, standing perfectly still and quiet for longer than four minutes, all right? So that's, that's to me, that's pretty major, all right? And if you don't think that self-control and empathy are things that are important to learn, in childhood, let's take a look at this study that was done uh, just last year, 2018, in the Netherlands, okay? Researchers wanted to know if they could detect a visible difference between the brains of psychopaths and non-psychopaths, and even more distinctly between the brains of criminal psychopaths and non-criminal psychopaths. They discovered that while all people with psychopathic tendencies appear to be extremely sensitive to reward, a key difference between those who engage in criminal activity and those who don't is that additional lack of self-control, all right? Psychopathy consists of several elements, including a lack of empathy and emotional involvement, as well as impulsive and severely antisocial egocentric behavior, all right? So I'm gonna leave you with this. Let your kids play or they'll turn into psych. okay. <laughs> it's very important though. All right, so now we're going into guided play. Um, guided play, I'm not going to give you a list because it's really, really good at one thing in particular, and that is learning, all right, teaching tough concepts. Now, according to this study that was done at the University of Pennsylvania also last year in 2018, it says that research has found that children who engaged in guided play activities were more likely to learn a target piece of information than children who engaged in free play, and in some cases, pay attention to this, even more than children who were directly instructed. For example, an intervention to teach new vocabulary words through book reading activities found little, found little learning when children played freely with toys related to the new word. Providing children with some adult guidance in their play, however, significantly increased the number of new words that children learned. All right? Kind of powerful, right? Enough said. No, actually, I'm going to say more. Okay, so there was a study of play in traumatized mothers and children. Now, this study was conducted, or it was published in September of 2006, all right? I need to give you kind of the, the ground rules, kind of like the, the base line. I, need to, I, I basically need to kind of let you know how this, I need to set up, give you the setting of, of this, of this uh, study, all right? So this study was actually taken, uh, it followed nine mother-child pairs who were in the Illinois welfare system, all right? The children in the study were all between the ages of two and four years old, had all experienced multiple traumas, had all been forcibly separated from their mothers. Five had witnessed repeated severe domestic abuse. Three had witnessed parental substance abuse. Three had been physically or sexually abused. All were seeing their mothers once a week, all right? So these are the children. The mothers, on the other hand, were all between the ages of 16 to 30. Five were unemployed. One was actively using drugs. One was clinically depressed. Seven experienced significant trauma in addition to being separated from their child. Five experienced domestic violence. Five reported significant childhood trauma. Five reported unresolved mental health problems. And three struggled with substance abuse. All right, so those are the moms. Now we're going to add color to the visits. The visits lasted one hour. Visits were generally unstructured, except for the requirement that mothers had to be sober and had to refrain from abusive behaviors, but other than that, do whatever you want. Visits took place in a well-stocked playroom that was comfortable and home-like with furniture, age-appropriate toys, and refreshments, all right? And last but not least, we need to look at how play was defined for the purpose of this study. Play was defined as such where actions, objects, persons, places, or other aspects of the here and now were transformed or treated non-literally, all right? So a doll, for instance, is animated. They're moving their arms and legs. They're <clears throat> making them speak, um, so on and so forth, all right? Or a child becomes a superhero. Or behaviors that are associated with one setting are used in another setting. So um, 
it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon, but a child lays down on the ground and says good night and covers himself up with a napkin would be considered pretend play. What, what this play is not, they said, would be something like taking a toy pancake and putting it in a toy pan. This would not be considered play in this study because it's not anything that, that would happen non-literally. You would literally in real life put pancakes in a pan. Okay, so that would not be considered play. Now we're going to take a look at two of the subjects of this um, of this study, May and Molly. It's a mother-daughter pair. May is a 27-year-old college graduate who was homeless after leaving uh, four-year-old Molly's abusive father. Molly was doing okay in her foster home, but is starting to act aggressively to other children in her preschool. Additionally, during play, Molly has been known to act out in violent and antisocial adult behavior. For example, during dollhouse play, Molly made the daddy doll shake the mommy doll while screaming in a doll voice, stop it, stop it, B word. All right. So now here's a scene. Here's, um, you know, some interaction that they noticed on camera. May and Molly are playing with puppets. Molly initiates pretend rough and tumble play and begins tickling May's puppet. May makes her puppet squeal and retaliate. May makes her puppet playfully hit Molly's puppet on the head. May. No, no, stop, stop. Playfully while smiling, May laughs and reaches for a plastic hunting knife. Molly, I'm going to get that knife. I'm going to cut her. May, no longer playing. No, you ain't going to get no knife. Knives are bad. Put the knife back. All right. And here you can see this is a really, really good example of the benefits that free play provides to allow four-year-old Molly to outwardly and reliably convey a very complex inner world that she would not have been able to do in any other circumstance or situation. With the addition of that adult supervision or, or caring adult supervision, this turns into guided play. And as you can see, it turns into a really, really valuable learning experience for Molly. All right. But unfortunately, play has been on the decline for several decades in childhoods everywhere. First of all, we have to look at schools. In Gadsden, Alabama, kindergartners' nap time was replaced with more te test prep. Kindergartners, all right? Wynell Williams, the elementary education director, said, if the state is holding us accountable, this is the way we have to do it. Kindergarten is not like it used to be. That's right, kids. Playtime is over, all right? In Kenosha, Wisconsin, after the school's test score threatened to put, put it on the state's watch list, Bain School of Arts and Language in Kenosha, Wisconsin, announced that recess would be done away with altogether. The principal said this, if teachers want to bring their students outside, it will be only for educational purposes and will include studying. And in Clark County schools in Nevada, when they were getting rid of recess all across the county, the superintendent said, if you have a 15 minute recess schedule, you spend five minutes getting students to the playground, another five getting back and then five more minutes getting them calmed down and ready to learn back in the classroom. You end up blowing 30 minutes of potential instructional time to gain the limited benefits of having recess. It's become a luxury we can't afford. <sighs> Yikes, all right? But it's not just schools, unfortunately, that have to bear some of the responsibility here, okay? Helicopter parenting or overprotective parents also have a little bit of, of blame here, all right? <clears throat> Dr. Robin Silverman, she's a leading child and adolescent development specialist. She gives a couple of reasons for this, uh, the need for control being one. Mom and dads have no control over pedophiles or the kidnappers that they read about in papers. They can, however, control how their children spend their time and, of course, with whom, all right? Bigger, better, faster. Children who are learning skills are usually slower and less adept than their parents. Therefore, it's not surprising for parents to feel that it would be faster, bigger, bolder, and just plain better if I take charge. Fear of failure. These moms and dads can't stand by and watch their child feel inadequate, unprepared, or miserable in any way. It's too heartbreaking. They believe that it's their job to shield their child from these negative emotions. All right, and then you have the need to keep them young. Some moms and dads are saddened by the idea of their children maturing and needing them less. When children are dependent on their parents, parents can feel more needed and wanted. And lastly is the need to live vicariously through their children. Um, that's kind of self-explanatory, okay? Um, but even if 
you are a parent that is providing your child with a, a, enough of the freedom to have unstructured play whenever they want, kids even have just a dash of blame here. All right, according to Psychology Today, children between the ages of 8 to 12 are spending six hours a day, 42 hours a week on screens and, and various devices. So that's phones, tablets, and TV, all right? Teenagers are up to nine hours a day, 63 hours a week. Children between the ages of two and five, four and a half hours a day, 32 hours a week, all right? Pop quiz, it's not really a pop quiz, but who, who's interested in, in how much screen time adults get daily? Is it A, 11 hours, 77 hours a week, B, 13 hours, 91 hours a week, or C, 15 hours a day, 105 hours a week? What do you got? A, B, or C? Okay. Do another five seconds, and then we're going to move on. Yeah, I see some right answers here. The answer is A, 11 hours a day, 77 hours a week. And I know that that's, you know, it's a lot less than 15, but considering we only have 24 hours a day and we got to use some of it to sleep, 11 hours a day is kind of a lot, all right? And so what we have with this increased screen time and the increased parental control and the increased focus on testing in schools, what's happening is play is quickly becoming a thing of the past and we're already suffering because of it, all right? According to Peter Gray, who is pretty much an expert in all things play, he said that since the 1950s when play started this downward trajectory, there has been a documented increase in childhood mental health disorders, a decline in younger generations sense that they have control over their lives, fates, and destinies. Standardized clinical assessment questionnaires show five to eight times more children suffer significant anxiety disorder or major depression as opposed to the 1950s. There's been a sharp decline in creativity and creative thinking since the 1980s. There's been a marked rise in narcissism and a sharp decline of empathy. Guys, this is the recipe for psychopathy right here, all right? And probably the saddest, the saddest result of all is that suicide rates have doubled for those between the ages of 15 and 24 and quadrupled for those under the age of 15. We're talking about babies now, babies. Play is not just a want, it's not even a need, it is a right of children everywhere. And we need to admit that we have a little bit of a problem, all right? I'm going to leave you, before we, we start taking questions, I'm going to leave you with a couple of these quotes, all right? Our children from their earliest years must take part in all of the more lawful forms of play, for if they are not surrounded with such an atmosphere, they can never grow up to be well-conducted and virtuous citizens. All right, and that's from Plato. Um, and if that's too much to remember, then we have all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Okay, so that's all I have. Are there any questions? I'd be more than happy to, to answer a few. I think you yes, might we do time. have some time. Thank you so much, Jenna. That was so I mean, I really enjoyed that. So uh, there is actually a question from Jay Waddell, and they would like to know: Are there any benefits of play? in regards to bullying? Oh, uh, that's a really good question, actually. Um, yeah, there are so many benefits to play. I know we had talked about, you know, the increasing of empathy, um, the collaborative skills, the teaching of how to manage these different emotions. Um, so there's definitely benefits on both sides. For kids that would be potential bullies, you know, we're looking at empathy, teaching empathy, in order, you know, and, and dealing with your fellow classmates, your fellow peers, you're kind of getting to see them on an up close and personal level. And so it kind of humanizes them more when you're actually playing with these kids face to face, all right? On the other side, for someone who could be a potential victim, um, playing teaches you those self advocacy skills, all right? So while you're playing, you know, if somebody pushes you down, you can start learning in play to get up and stand up for yourself so that you're not so much of a, uh, of a victim in a sense. So yeah, there, there's lots of benefits on both sides. Awesome. Um, 
If you all have any further questions, feel free. The chat box is open and you can go ahead and add them there. I do have another question. Um, can play be useful among older students uh, in middle school or high school? Can play be useful among you said older students? Yeah, so students? either middle school students or high school students. Absolutely. They're still, they're, they're probably not going to be learning particular concepts, but what they will be learning just in that face to face interaction is that empathy, especially. All right. J I'm telling you, the getting away from behind your screens and talking to people face to face, seeing the look in their eyes, seeing their personality and the things that make them tick, it makes them human. All right. And, and it teaches you not even. It, it teaches that child also like it shows them different personalities and how to deal with different people in different circumstances. And so, yeah, there's benefits to play for uh, high school students. There's benefits to play even for adults. So, yeah, so there's there's benefits all Definitely, across the board. I agree. I agree with all of that. Um, and then we have one more question from Candice. Um, is there anything that we can do to fight against play decline? Is there anything in place to discuss it? Um, one thing that can be done, and really to answer this question, it depends on how you interact with children. Like, are you a teacher? Are you a parent? How exact, what exactly is your interaction with children? I know for parents, one thing that you can do is just um, take your kids outside and leave the devices inside, all right? Just take them outside, let them explore. Um, one of my favorite ones that I've heard is just let your kids get bored. Give them the opportunity to get bored and find ways to entertain themselves, explore new things, find find new things. Um, for teachers, um, there's a lot there's a lot of changes that I understand needs to be made at like state and school level. So if you're talking about a teacher just inside of that classroom, one of the main ways that teachers can start combating this play decline is I know that there's this tendency of teachers to want to take away recess from kids that are misbehaving when actually recess can help to kind of straighten out some of these behavioral issues, all right? And if your child is having issues studying and focusing in class, play and recess might be the thing that will turn them around. So um, on a teaching level, I would say that uh, just that not taking away recess, finding another way to, um, to discipline students would, would absolutely help. With Thank you. Time. And then we have one more question from Sherry Campbell. Um, Parents be concerned with child play that is filled with make believe. Um, no, I this make believe makes me think that you're talking about something else. But just taking it at face value, um, make believe really allows children to explore their imagination. All right, as adults. Our imaginations and our creativity has taken all kinds of hits, so we don't have the same types of imagination, the same creativity that children have, but allowing them to make believe play allows them to access different thought patterns, uh, come up with different ways to handle things that we might not be aware of because we're adults and because we already have our, uh, our kind of set ways of doing things. So um, I would actually encourage parents to just allow their kids to make believe play. Um, you know, even provide them with, with, you know, toys and maybe costumes or whatever it is that they need to really explore that uh, they're imagining. Awesome. And um, I will be sending out this PowerPoint to all of our viewers today. Um, but one other question that Candace did have, um, and maybe you have a couple of other resources, Jana, is where can um, we find more information about this? Okay, I attached um, every, all of the resources that I use to, to compile all of this information is in, it's on the very last slide of this presentation. So that's probably a good place to start. Also, I suggest, um, there's a lot of books about play. The, uh, I want to call it the, the Regia Amelia Method is a book about play that I've actually just started reading and it's really, really informative. Also, um, Peter Gray, who is a researcher on play, all things play, he does TED Talks, he has books, he has a lot of studies and, and research that he's done. So I would also kind of look at him and kind of dive into his resources too, to Thank get you. more information. 
I want to end it with one more question because I did catch this one. Any other questions, um, you, you can send me an email and I will make sure to send them to Jenna and she will go ahead and respond to those accordingly. But one other question from Lizette Hernandez is what about violent pretend play? Have you heard? But violent pretend play. Now this is actually a really good opportunity to turn to turn into a uh, a kind of guided play session all right violent pretend play oftentimes signals something that the child has seen uh at home a lot of times so if there's an adult who's just watching they can catch these things and now you can actually use this as a way of teaching that child um this is not the way to handle these situations like i see you know you're playing you pulled out a gun this kind of thing you know maybe asking the kid why are you leaning towards playing this way or you know maybe we should do it this way let's talk about some things and this is actually giving you a glimpse into that child's inner world so you know um of course we don't want to see that type of play but if you do i think that it is it would be such a great idea if you could just kind of capitalize on that and use it as a learning tool to kind of prevent violent behavior thank you so much so that is the end of our q a session i just want to go ahead and thank everybody for watching our take 30 webinar today a huge thank you to jenna for this wonderful presentation like i said i will go ahead and send the powerpoint to everybody that registered today and viewed the webinar um, please keep an eye out on our youtube page the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation, I will go ahead and upload this webinar and you all are able to watch it as well. And you'll be sent a replay after the webinar too. Um, please keep an eye out for further information regarding our bullying prevention conference on November 19th and um, follow us on all of our social media. So we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, Anti-Bullying Institute. So again, a thank you all to everybody and a huge thank you to Jaina. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay.